I would like to turn it over to Sister Carrie Pohl, who is our event facilitator. Sister Carrie. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this important meeting to discuss many issues and concerns and to prepare for the startup of the Shell petrochemical plant in our community. As Mark mentioned, my name is Sister Carrie Pohl and I'm the Congregational Coordinator of Justice and Peace for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden here in Beaver County. And I'll be facilitating the meeting tonight. Um, this month marks 120 years since the Sisters of St. Joseph moved here from Evansburg. Little history for you. Um, Beaver County is the ancestral land of the Hopewell culture and Osage people. By the mid 1600s, the Iroquois nations had expanded into the area. In a mid 1700s census at a town that the Lenape called extensive flats, the French called Beaver and the English called Logstown, located in what today is considered Harmony Township. The population was noted to contain members of five of the six Iroquois nations, as well as members of the Wyandotte, Shawnee, Mississauga, Mohican, and Lenape peoples. In 1780, after the creation of the United States of America, the part of Beaver County that is south of the Ohio River became part of Pennsylvania. Previously, it was considered to be part of Virginia. Beaver County itself as a governmental structure was formed in 1880 from portions of Washington and Allegheny counties. Today, Beaver County has a population of just under 170,000 people with roots from pretty much all over the world. Um, it has two high school football teams that will be competing in the state championship games starting tomorrow. Go Aliquippa, go Central Valley and is the location of what is perhaps the most visible sign of the petrochemical industry's expansion in our region, the Shell Pennsylvania Petrochemicals Complex. As someone reminded me tonight, the second Wednesday of December marks the five year anniversary of day two of what I believe was the first public hearing related to the Shell plant, a conditional use permit hearing in Potter Township followed the next night by a DEP hearing about the proposed plant at Central Valley High School. Wow. Before we get started with tonight's first speaker, we're pleased to share a video directed by Mark Dixon, who's been with us every step of the way over the past five years in preparing for the petrochemical facility in our community. He's filmed most of the public hearings related to the plant from Potter Township to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, as well as other public events. Mark has incorporated extensive drone footage and photos in this video, most of which were provided courtesy of Mr. Ted Alk at Frat Tracker Alliance to document how the Shell property along the beautiful Ohio River transformed from an empty dirt lot to the massive plant that you see today. The video will be available online shortly after tonight's program. If I was in your place, I would not want it on my conscience to turn the Beaver Valley into the Cancer Valley. I really hope that we don't have to decide between jobs and health. I think there are other options. Is it worth poisoning the children and family members for a few jobs in a dying industry? All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Woo. The motion carries. How many want clean air? Yeah. How many want clean water? Yeah. No person's job has a right to make me, my family, and my neighbors sick. The Shell Ethane Cracker Plant will be a major source of air pollution for local communities and in the region. Along with the cracker comes the fracking that feeds it. That means frack wells, that means compressor stations, cryogenic plants, injection wells, pipelines, diesel trucking and rail transport and train bombs. Each step has risk. Each step generates pollution. Each step is known to cause ill health. Each step is a step backwards. And all of this is rolled out piecemeal by the industry so that people never see the big picture. I'm asking for the DEP to decline the permits as submitted. Pipelines fail because pipelines fail. Shell was responsible for 194 pipeline incidents since 2002, totaling some $183 million in damages. The cracker plant's also a disaster from a climate perspective. This one plant alone will emit 2.2 million tons of CO2 per year, which is the same as 430,000 passenger cars on a road for a year. 
Some have refrained from speaking out in fear of retribution. We just care about the health of our communities. The people who will be most affected are going to be the elderly and children. It will be the largest emitter of volatile organic compounds in the southwestern PA. Some of the schools that would be most impacted by air pollution from the Shellathane Cracker Plant are Central Valley School District, Beaver Area School District, and Rochester Area School District. It's called Cancer Out for a reason. Deny these permits! We want to breathe and drink water here! Have I stepped out of a time machine? Is this 1956 as opposed to 2016? Because we must have traveled back in time if we're still talking about fossil fuels. The oil and gas industry will make billions, out-of-state construction workers get the jobs, and Beaver Countyans will get polluted air and water. Why would we want to add to our burden? This takes us in the wrong direction. I feel that this is an insidious, violent abuse of all of us. We will not make Western PA or Potter great again. We will make cancer, heart disease, and asthma great again. We have alternatives. We need the political will to pursue them. Well, thank you, Mark and Ted, and all who made that video a reality. I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Clifford Lau, who will give us an overview of the Shell plant. Dr. Lau is an adjunct professor of chemistry at Duquesne University. He's also a member of the Beaver County Marcellus Awareness Community, or BCMAC. I'd invite you to please post your questions in the chat, and we'll have a Q&A session while the presentations are finished. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Mm -hmm. Hello, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual meeting on preparing for the petrochemical. Good to see you all here. I'm going to give you a the nickel tour of the shell cracker plant so that when you see something happening, you may know better what you're looking at. The shell cracker plant, as was said in the uh, video there, uh, is not the, is only the base point that you need you also need to have existing fracking wells. You need to have to supply the ethane. You need the cryo plants to purify it. You need the compressor stations to move it, and many pipelines. The shell plant uses about 100,000 barrels of ethane a day to make plastic. The shell plant is built on the old horsehead zinc smelter plant, which is almost. 400 acres, so we have a lot to cover this evening. Here's a wide-angle photograph of the cracker plant. It's a world-sized plant, but not the latest as far as technology, as far as how to make ethane, which this plant will be used to make 1.8 million tons of polyethylene per year. And it's easier to think of it as that's 100 rail cars per day of pellets growing out of this plant. If you look over to the right side that we have here is the heart of the unit. One reason why this plant is so large is actually it's a combination of several plants being a cracking plant and the polymerization plant and the other things that go with it. But the first part of the process is the ethylene, the cracking unit, and it contains seven furnaces that heat up the ethane to 100 or 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit and under pressure uh, makes it into ethylene, which uh, actually I like to call it to be dehydrogenation. And then you see that there's seven uh, uh, hours there, stacks there. They run six of them at a time while they decoke the seven. So it gives you some idea of how brutal this reaction is. Here's the quenching tower, which cools down the reaction. And then here's the cooling tower, which further removes the heat from the process. The next part we'll look at is the uh, process cooling cells. And then we'll look at the polyethylene polymerization units. So once we have the 
ethylene, it is put into this unit to be uh, polymerized into uh, polyethylene plastic. And these uh, purge bends are where it's stored and it goes around through the cycle to produce uh, low density polyethylene and then also high density uh, polyethylene. Now you should recognize to the right hand side of here, the polymerization unit that we just talked about. And you can see that there is a uh, pipeline running over to this uh, storage area over here. These are the polyethylene storage silos where the pellets are stored for the uh, trucks to take away the, the material. Here's another view of the storage units, and then you can also see the main gate and the administration uh, buildings in the background. The next part we're going to look at is the flares. Now we've made the, the polyethylene, we've uh, cooled them down. In fact, these cooling bins here that we, we went had, I forgot to mention, these are the, the cooling towers that back in the end of September, the maple syrup, they were putting anti-corrosive work on these towers, these uh, units here, and that's where the maple syrup smell originated from, if you guys are familiar with that. But to look at the other part of it, once we made the product or whatever, we have a lot of byproducts, and those byproducts are then burned off by several different type of flares. We have a multi-point ground flare, high pressure flare, two ground flares, and one elevated flare. The other one, the flares are off to the right. We have two flares here. This is a, a ground level flare. They burn off all the VOCs and the HAPs, uh, hazardous air pollutants, and that's where all the carbon dioxide, the nitrous oxide, the sulfur dioxide, and the particles that they talk about as far as the emission process. Along with those flares, there are also 62 stacks and uh, the four flares and seven fugitives. And you ask, well, what are fugitives? Fugitive emissions are basically leaks. So these are all the things that contribute to the emissions of the plant. I can't show them all. There's just too many of them. Here is a nighttime photograph of the shell plant in construction, so it's not totally lit up, but you can see how much light pollution is produced just by this small section. And this is without flares. Once the flares come on like large candles, it'll have a lot more light being produced. Another part of the plant is there's a lot of tank storage for all the raw materials that they use and things. And notice how many of them are VOC related. So if one of these were to have an accident, that could also cause a very uh, large light event. So now we've got the process and the help with this is called the cogen plant. And that's located here in the middle of the plant. Here's a closer up view. You can see there's actually three cogen units. What cogen means is they take uh, the methane that's resulting from the cracking in the hydrogen and also natural gas, and they burn it to generate steam and, and electricity or steam and, and generate electricity. This is the steam blow that was happening over the last couple of months to clean out the, uh, the uh, cogen units. Now, besides getting rid of all the organics and papers and stuff, there's a lot of water produced. All that uh, quenching and, and water cooling and all that, all that water has to be processed. So over to the far right, there's the water processing unit. Here's a close-up picture of this end of the plant where the water processing unit is. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the water permit for the plant has been grandfathered from the horsehead water permit. And so therefore, it does not uh, have them hold it to the higher standard 
of lower total dissolved solid uh, uh, that the new level has. So they'll be able to put in uh, material that has hollow uh, total dissolved solids because they're grandfathered with the old horse head uh, permit. And now we move all the way to the left-hand side of the plant. And this is the rail yards and the north retention pond. This is where all those rail cars, 100 a day, are filled up with pellets and are shipped off to the uh, manufacturer to make more plastic bags. This pond here, oops, what happened to my cursor? But the pond here is the north retention pond. And one interesting thing I wanted to say about that was I kept reading in the description of it that this pond was for AC water. I said, gee whiz, that's a lot of air conditioning going on. Well, just like most of the terms in all this facility, AC doesn't stand for air conditioning. It stands for accidental contamination. So when they're washing the, the rail cars or some of the plants here, uh, run off with the uh, materials, it goes here to be then processed. So accidental contamination. So for a review of all the units, you can see there's a lot of uh, working parts to this uh, shell facility and a lot of petrochemical activity going on. So as you'll see in the rest of the presentations, how what your actions are through this plant will determine what kind of world we'll have. So thanks for listening. And thank you so much, Dr. Lau. Our next presentation is on final permitting for the Shell plant and Shell's fence line monitoring system. There will be two people presenting. First, Mr. Adam Crone, a senior attorney at Earth Justice in Washington, DC, and Mr. Car Carl Karner, Engineering and Technical Coordinator at Clean Air Council. Thank you both. Yeah, uh, I'm Adam Krohn, as, uh, as uh, I said, but uh, I'm an attorney with um, Earth Justice, and I'll be talking about uh, the basically the final air permitting for the Shell Complex. Uh, Carl then will talk about uh, fence line monitoring that will occur once the uh, facility is operating. So uh, first things first, I just want to mention, uh, I, I am an attorney, but this is not intended as legal advice. Um, these are my opinions and observations as to permitting, um, but um, you know, I, I can provide some resources and just uh, you know, what I've learned about uh, this over the years. So where we currently are is that Shell has uh, plan approval, plan approvals, which are basically, uh, you've heard, heard these called uh, construction permits, maybe, maybe new source review permits. The first of these was issued in 2015. This was like the original one for the facility. There have been a couple subsequent modifications that were most recently issued in uh, this year in 2021 for uh, some modifications and for some uh, insulation of the high voltage components. But the gist is that um, Shell hasn't completed construction on the facility or begun operating. But once it does, it will need a Title V operating permit to cover those operations. And we know that as of today, it has not yet applied for that. So this could cover an entire presentation, but basically what's in a Title V permit, um, the, the purpose is to collect all the requirements for a facility in one place. Um, and what it basically contains is you've got your enforceable limits on pollution, uh, the monitoring and reporting requirements to ensure compliance with those uh, requirements, and then other conditions to assure compliance. So in terms of what to expect with Shell, uh, this is a, um, a screenshot from their website, um, the Q&A after their recent presentation. And uh, they're, they're saying right now that uh, they expect it to be online in 2022. They don't have a specific month, um, but just based on that, we can say, for now, we know that the plan approvals it has will give it coverage for temporary operations, basically 180 days at a time. Uh, these can be extended, but um, in the generally those are you know what cover it while uh, the Title V uh, permitting process goes on, goes on. So once uh, Shell basically completes the construction, begins operating, and gets through the shakedown period, it will schedule uh, an initial operating permit inspection with the Department of Environmental Protection. And if the EP is satisfied with that uh, inspection, it will then require Shell to submit the Title V 
application. And that's when DEP starts the permitting process. Once DEP releases the draft permit for public comment, that's usually um, the, the public typically has about 30 days. That can be extended, but 30 days is the default. Now, DEP has to legally respond to all public comments on a permit. Um, it doesn't have to take those comments, but it has to respond to all of them. If it then decides to issue the permit, there's a whole subsequent process in which EPA gets involved. Uh, EPA basically has 45 days to weigh in. You can choose to object at that point and send uh, DEP back to uh, correct the permit, or it can choose not to object. But what that triggers is the public also has the uh, opportunity to petition EPA for an objection on a number of different bases. And yeah, there's a lot out there on that, but um, it all comes back to what's required in, in the Title V permit. So I'll leave you just with these uh, three important resources. Uh, there's the PA Bulletin. That's where you'll see the draft permit posted. Uh, that, that's usually published on Saturdays. Um, that will trigger the public comment period. DEP also has a web page for the complex, which um, contains all the permits. Uh, it's not automatically updated, so you might not see the um, materials there right away. But DEP is supposed to play, uh, put everything you need for uh, comments on that web page. And then we've got eFacts, which is uh, a bit more automatic. It's a little bit hard to navigate. This is pretty technical, but I've got a couple of links here, and I can uh, I'll provide those later on. But these will kind of show you. You, you, you get a sense of when Shell is applied and uh, you know what's going on if DEP is considering the application, if it's under technical review, and so forth. So um, for that, I will turn it over to Carl. Thanks, Adam. Hi, everyone. I'm Carl Kerner. I'm the engineer at Clean Air Council. I've been working uh, along with Adam on the ethane cracker for uh, about eight years now, uh, since about 2014. Uh, so <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, it's been a long time coming. And uh, this I'm a, uh, is the fence line monitoring program for the facility that we got through a settlement uh, with EIP and Cleaner Council uh, on the plan approval application. So basically the, the process uh, before the Title V permit that Adam was just talking about. Uh, this system, and it may be kind of hard to see and a little uh, weird to explain, but uh, I'll try to walk through it uh, real quick on this map. Uh, this is sort of an estimated outline of what the system is going to be. Uh, we have two types of air monitoring at the facility. Uh, continuous air monitoring system, uh, which is always going, and a passive air monitoring system. Uh, so the passive one is lining the fence line. It was modeled after a refinery rule, uh, which means there are two possibilities. Uh, there are a bunch of blue pins. Uh, those are the passive monitors. And then there are pins with stars. Those are like the most strict option they can do under the refinery rule. Uh, up in the uh, upper right, or sorry, lower right hand corner uh, is the windrows of the facility. So the prevailing wind direction. And then you'll see cams one, two, and four in green. Uh, those are the uh, active uh, continuous air monitoring systems at the facility. Those are always measuring. And if they hit a certain level, which we'll talk about later, uh, they trigger a, a inspection and they open a sumo canister, which is a type of uh, collection device that can speciate, give you different uh, sort of levels of individual hazardous air pollutants or HAPs. So uh, pollutants being monitored, uh, the passive air monitoring system, uh, the thing surrounding the facility, uh, measures benzene every two weeks uh, and it's one surrounding the facility. Uh, the continuous air monitoring system uh, measures total VOCs, so just whatever is generally in the air, uh, continuously uh, reduced to five minute averages. Uh, so once every five minutes, you'll get a posting the website that'll say, this is the total amount of VOCs. If that goes above a certain level, it triggers a sumic canister and it measures uh, things called in the settlement agreement, pollutants of potential concern, benzene, 1,3-butadiene, N-hexane, naphthalene, and toluene. And those pollutants are, or they were chosen because they were uh, basically the ones that we were the most concerned about from a concentration standpoint, but also a uh, sort of health risk standpoint. So they were the things that they were going to emit the most of and also had the highest health risk uh, actually from Shell's health risk assessment. 
Um, so there's going to be a website that will display all of these data. Um, I actually have the website that was supposed to be uh, what was uh, what it's going to be posted to, but that's not final yet. So uh, the way that the data posting works, uh, the website will be on 30 days after uh, the fence line monitoring program commences. There'll be tables of data, uh, including two week passives and 15 minute uh, block real time or five minutes if there's an exceedance. Uh, and I know this gets really complicated, so I apologize. Uh, and then SUMA canister data for all pollutants will be on there and on-site meteorological data will also be there. Uh, when a level is exceeded, an action level is what it's called in the agreement, uh, there will be a field investigation uh, which is basically they have to go out in the field and say, here's where the leak is coming from. Here's where this elevated concentration is coming from. They have to do a root cause analysis, fix the problem. And all of that's going to be on the website as well. So once this website is up, we're going to train people on it. Uh, and it'll be a resource for the community to see what's in the air uh, at certain times. And also the quality assurance uh, protocol will be on the website as well. So there will be a lot of information to look at. We're going to try to help people to understand it uh, later on once this is all more final. Uh, the full system, so the monitors come online uh, kind of gradually, and people have been very concerned about uh, baseline data and background. Um, so the full system will be online 30 days from normal operation, which is the completion of construction and temporary operation for shakedown of sources not to exceed 180 days. That's right from the agreement. Uh, basically, that means we don't know what the levels are going to be like when the facility is coming online, but the passive monitors will be running during that time, no later than 30 days after the startup of the first cracker unit. So basically, we'll have a passive system measuring sort of the background concentration, uh, and then the normal system will kick in with the continuous air monitoring. Um, and that's mainly because shakedown is a weird sort of period where a lot of stuff is happening and there's no control over emissions. We're not going to get good data. Um, but I'm sure Mark will talk about other community monitoring initiatives that should be able to capture that time as well. Um, the system will be online for five years. Uh, that's as long as the permit lasts. So the Title V permit only lasts for five years and it's up for renewable or up for a renewal. And then uh, the system must have a 95% uptime. Uh, the 5% downtime is just kind of built in to how any system's operated uh, and it has to be logged and posted to the website. So they can't say, oh, this was down at this time. They have to actually show when it was down, they have to log it and it has to be 95%. All right, so we talked about the investigations. I'm not gonna get too into the action levels and how they're adjusted, but basically we have these numbers are for the continuous air monitoring system. Uh, there are 56 parts per billion, 63 and 48. Uh, and then there's a background monitor uh, that's near the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so what will happen is the difference between the background and the monitor, if it goes above that, it triggers the SUMA canister, collects the individual HAPs, goes to a lab that gets posted to the website. Uh, if there are too many false positives, uh, you can adjust the levels under certain conditions, and they can't be adjusted upward more than 10%. Too many non-detects, and uh, they, sorry, flip those. <laughs> if there are too many false positives, you can't adjust the, the levels uh, downward more than 10%, and non-detects, you can't adjust it upward more than 10%. So there's flexibility built into the system, but it's such that it's not going to uh, radically change these numbers. And that's pretty much the basics of how the system works. Uh, I, I'll be around for questions. There's a lot to take in, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get everyone in the community up and using the website, monitoring these, uh, we'll be monitoring these numbers. Uh, we wanna have a team of citizens monitoring these numbers and that way we can all be informed about what's actually in the air pretty much in real time. Uh, and if something happens at the facility, we'll have a lot of information about it and be able to take action. Thank you, Mr. Kerner, Mr. Crone. Our next presentation is on the petrochemical health impacts we can expect from the Shell plant. 
I'd like to introduce Dr. Ned Kitayer of Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania and the Environmental Health Project. Mr. Uh, Dr. Kitayer. Well, it's not a secret what happens wherever a petrochemical facility like an ethane cracker operates and the devastating pollution and health impacts that threaten nearby communities. Cracking ethane to manufacture trillions of tiny plastic nurdles every year isn't going to heal this region's long legacy of toxic air and polluted waterways and the health problems that follow. It will intensify the burden of global plastic pollution and it will accelerate global warming. Nothing about making more single-use plastic will lead to improvements in public health. On the contrary, the damage to health, the environment, and the planet's climate system will be significant. Every cracker plant emits these air toxics in large quantities 24-7. The shell cracker is no different. With all of the fracking and cracking going on here, it's easy to see why medical providers and local residents are worried that Southwestern Pennsylvania will soon become America's next cancer alley. These mostly invisible chemical emissions are enough to make people living and working nearby sick, such as nitrogen oxides, which are respiratory irritants that contribute to ground level ozone, which is a dangerous air toxic that stunts lung growth in infants and makes breathing difficult for everybody. Carbon monoxide is toxic to everyone. Volatile organic compounds like benzene, which can cause cancer in adults and in children, and toluene, another VOC, that can cause permanent neurologic damage. PM 2.5 is fine invisible particle pollution that damages the lungs, the heart, and other organs, and significantly increases cancer risk. Other hazardous air pollutants and ammonia can also harm health. And let me point out the 2.2 megatons of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide equivalents every year, enough greenhouse gas emissions to help accelerate global climate change. None of these chemicals will make you healthier if you are exposed to them. All of them can potentially make you a loved one, or a friend sick. Shell and the DEP know about the potential inhalation risk that arises from breathing in these, uh, air, uh, these toxic air contaminants. You deserve to know too. Mild exposure to some of these air toxics can bring ear, eyes, nose, and throat irritation to some people. Moderate exposure can lead to additional symptoms such as headaches, which for some can be debilitating. Uh, in the event of an accident or during a temperature inversion that traps pollution in the river valley, higher exposures might result in more severe symptoms such as shortness of breath and chest pain, palpitations and changes in heart rate and blood pressure. And extreme exposures can lead to impaired cognition, difficulty concentrating and confusion. The long-term outlook from exposure to air pollution from a large industrial facility like this one doesn't look any better. In fact, we know that chronic exposure to air pollution makes people sick from pregnancy to childhood and into adulthood, from cradle to a premature grave. So what should people living and working nearby do to protect themselves and their families from harm from this new toxic neighbor? First, keep an eye on Shell and keep the emergency resources highlighted in this community meeting handy for quick access. Take note of changes in your environment, like unexplained odors and changes in the color and smell of your water and changes to the health of your pets. Be friendly with your neighbors and talk to them about what's going on and look out for each other and report your concerns. Remember, if you see something or smell something, say something. Keep an eye on your health and the health of your family members. Keep a, keeping a health diary or a journal is useful to tr keep track of symptoms. Write down your symptoms like congestion and nosebleeds, headaches, breathing problems, chest pain, abdominal pain, skin rashes, and stress, which is a side effect of pollution exposure. 
take note of changing environmental conditions like changes to air and water quality and local weather conditions. Health concerns should be reported to the Pennsylvania Department of Health. But let me remind everyone to please call 911 or seek immediate, immediate emergency care if you or someone else is having a medical emergency. For other acute and chronic health symptoms, please give your primary care doctor a call and talk it over with them. Health providers may not immediately make the connection between your zip code and your symptoms. So it's important to let them know where you live and work, where your kids go to school and play, and what symptoms you're worried about. Please help yourself and your community by staying informed and being prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katire. Next, we'll hear two presentations on air pollution monitoring. First, Ms. Anna Hoffman from Carnegie Mellon University's CREATE Lab, and Mr. Mark Dixon with Blue Lens, who's also our tech director for today's or tonight's event, excuse me. Um, thank you, Ms. Hoffman. So let's take a look at the regulatory monitoring network to understand if the EPA government air quality monitors are providing the right data to enforce clean air standards in communities around the Shell Cracker plant. Um, from the September 2020 EPA air quality, um, I'm assuming it's a construction permit file for Shell, we know that the highest facility-wide emissions will be carbon monoxide, um, CO, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and nitrogen oxides, um, or NOx, just like, just like Ned was describing. Looking at the, um, the monitoring network that EPA provides in the area, we don't see any active CO, carbon monoxide monitors, um, which would be in that dark blue color. Um, there is a single NO2 monitor to indicate NOx pollution in light blue to the north of the plant in Beaver Falls, and a single ozone monitor above Vanport in pink, which could measure the late stage transformations of VOC pollution, um, not real time emissions from the plant. The rest of the monitoring network that you see here um, measures airborne lead and PM10 from some distance, reflecting the region's monitoring needs in the past. Um, it does not appear to have a comprehensive network to accurately reflect people's exposure to harmful pollution from Shell. You can download daily average data from these monitors in spreadsheet formats from epa.gov and see the map I showed here at this second link, um, and I can add it to the chat if you'd like. But there is no animated, accessible government map of real-time data um, from regulatory monitors that um, could produce enforce it, enforcement besides um, the, um, the website that um, Carl and Adam um, fought hard to, to make for us. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it to Mark Dixon to talk a little bit more about monitoring beyond what the, what the government provides. Thank you, Anna. Just going to share my screen here. Hello, everybody. So in my, put my other hat on and um, I'm going to talk about monitoring, particularly low cost monitoring around the shell ethane cracker plant. A lot of my work is um, supported, a lot of the work around um, monitoring around Shell is supported um, through the Direct Support Fund, and the Direct Support Fund is made possible by the Heinz Endowments and the 11th Hour Project, and it's a project of the Mountain Watershed Association. And for more information or to apply, please visit mountainwatershed.com. Um, I've been documenting pollution in and around the Mon Valley for several years now, um, using low cost monitors, primarily purple air monitors that measure small particulate matter. And I've noticed that there are strong inversions at night. You can see here, this is the map of two different days with the purple air monitor. It gets red at night and it extends all the way up to Shell, um, which is all around here, this area where my mouse is. And when I realized that Shell may emit more volatile organic compounds than Clareton Coke works, at least it's certainly permitted to emit more, um, then um, that I, I felt that it was that it would be wise to um, to also see what the monitors can reveal 
Um, it will also emit a significant proportion, though not as much as Claritin Coke works. But we see very strong signals on these very low cost monitors in and around the Mon Valley. So I thought it would be a really interesting um, experiment and possibly a really helpful way to uh, enable the community to have more agency in their relationship to Shell by deploying a network of monitors around Shell. This is a little flyer that I use for the project. You're welcome to screenshot it or ask me for it later. Basically, we're a group of citizens supplying community members with low-cost air monitors um, and basically trying to hold Shell to account and keep a close eye on what are the actual conditions on the ground, um, what are they um, in between the regulatory monitors, what are they outside of Shell's fence line monitors, et cetera. Um, there are many partners that have been connected to this project. The Environmental Health Project in particular will be writing a pre and post pre to post launch analysis of the monitor data. So looking at data from a sort of a baseline perspective and then looking at after Shell starts up into full production, um, then what, what can we learn about how the air has changed from the perspective of these low cost monitors? And some monitors have been up since December of 2020. So we hope to have a decent baseline. We've also been coordinating with Beaver County Marcellus Awareness Community, the Clean Air Council and others in the Breathe Collaborative and beyond. These are the two types of monitors that we're using. Oh, pardon me. Um, on the left, you see an AirViz monitor. Um, and on the right, you see the purple air monitor. And AirViz, I'm using primarily for volatile organic compounds, but it also measures particles. And purple air, I'm using primarily for particles, but it also measures, at least experimentally, of volatile organic compounds, like toluene, for instance. This is what they look like deployed. They're, they're pretty um, small, like the size of a small coffee cup. This is a map of the purple air monitors. They're very popular in the United States. You can see there's some air pollution happening in California on this particular day. This was just this week, uh, but the, the pollution readings vary all throughout the country. And actually these are deployed all around the world. They're very highly regarded as low cost monitors in particular. This is where zooming in a little closer on our region. You can see I've labeled where a shell cracker is. Zooming, continuing to zoom in. This is the relationship to Pittsburgh and the main cluster here in the Mon Valley where I've deployed many purple air monitors and others have started to deploy them as well, especially around here, around here, those are not mine. And this is where the shell monitor is, I mean, the shell monitors are. And um, we can see some monitors down here. Um, the Communities First has started deploying monitors to capture what extends up the, the Ohio, Ohio River Valley there and zooming in even closer. And so here you can see some of the um, monitor sites that I've started to deploy. I've got about 14 sites. Um, sometimes the monitors go down for a little bit. I've got to keep them up, but there's roughly 14 that are under this project. And when you click on a monitor, oh, and I'm hoping to get up to 20, each site has both a VOC, a VOC and a purple, sorry, both all, all sites will eventually have a VOC monitor and a particle monitor. Um, a purple air monitor and, a, and an AirViz monitor. When you click on a monitor on this map, which is open to the public, anybody can look at these anytime um, at this map.purpleair.com. You can go there and I'll include links to all this information in the chat after my presentation. But you can see on the left-hand side, you can see that you can, um, there are real time, uh, there's a real time graph of the pollution levels over time. And you can layer them with additional um, uh, monitors, so you can click and see how it compares to Pittsburgh's air or to Vermont's air or India's air. Um, this is a close-up of what that looks like, and you can see these um, these patterns where it goes up and down. Uh, it, often in the daytime um, or in the nighttime, you get an inversion pattern, and then at nighttime, and then in the daytime, then um, the inversion is released and the air pollution diminishes. And so I think we're we're going to be playing really paying really close attention to how high these spikes go during the nighttime hours when there is potentially a strong inversion. This is the AirViz um, website uh, display at voc.createlab.org. And this is the VOC reading on the purple air monitors. And you can see the little chart on the left. This is still experimental. So I don't want people to become alarmed if they see that the numbers go skyrocket into the red. Um, I think that there is some additional calibration that probably ought to be done um, I don't notice stench or any weird issues, even when these purpler monitors in the Mon Valley get up into the orange or red levels. So I think that there's some color calibration that needs to be done. Again, the VOCs for purpler are still regarded as experimental and should be, should be considered as such. This is just a close up of what that looks like, but you can see that nighttime daytime pattern happening. And that's when we're really concerned is when those strong inversions happen at night. 
do the pollution levels go up? I've seen pollution levels go up as much as 10 times between daytime and nighttime levels. And if that really holds, we it's a real mystery as to what that will mean for if there is a release from uh, the shell cracker. We don't know how it will interact with these strong inversion patterns. Um, I'm seeking additional monitors. Uh, if you're interested in hosting a monitor look at one of these locations, I don't have enough monitors to support every single one of these little pink squares. Um, but in time, there may be additional funding that emerges or other groups that emerge to help support the um, additional monitoring. And so if you're interested in that, please do reach out to me. I'll have my con contact information at the end. This is a really cool uh, map developed by the Environmental Health Project meant to prioritize areas for monitoring. And it shows where we can expect more pollutants to show up. This modeling doesn't show an amount of a particular pollutant in any area. It's not a prediction. It's based on historical data. But this is where we'd expect to see more primary pollutants ending up coming off the facility on average. And then also the next slide will show a maximum hourly levels. I can't say that any given location is dangerous or safe. It's important for me to say that. Uh, but it is good for prioritizing monitor locations. Um, that said, it's reasonable to expect that an area in red will probably receive more pollution than an area with no color. And just for the record, this is some additional caveat information about the sourcing and credit. And then this is the two-year maximum concentration slide. Very interesting to see, um, and I think it's a, a maximum hourly concentration of primary air pollutants from the shell, I think, cracker in Beaver. And this is using historical data. This is not a prediction. It's just a model. So some may ask, will it smell? Um, and it's worth noting that some of the pollutants that we expect to, to see coming, coming out of the shell facility are benzene, which has a sweet, aromatic, gasoline-like odor, um, toluene, um, sorry, toluene, which has a sweet, pungent, benzene-like odor. Um, ammonia also smells. It has a urine or sweat-like odor. Um, these happen at, at varying levels of concentration, um, but it's worth noting that there will be um, more VOCs at the shell cracker, at least permitted, um, compared to the Claritin Coke Works actual emissions. There will also be similar, um, actually more, slightly more ammonia at Claritin Coke Works, um, emitted by Claritin Coke Works than, than um at the shell cracker than at Claritin Coke Works. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, and so we're finding that this is, um, I think the day on the right. Um, so this day, I believe is the day that this Smell Pittsburgh app was showing all these smells. And so in the Mon Valley, um, you have this phenomenon where you get a lot of sulfur compounds in H2S that creates a smell effect in the region. We're not gonna have the same H2S or sulfur compounds at the levels that are um, at the levels we're seeing in the Mon Valley with the Claritin Coke Works. Um, but, it is, um, but it's worth noting that we will have inversion, um, inversions that extend up, as you can see by this, by both charts or both, both um, images here, you still see that sort of the, the air is polluted and trapped close to the ground. We just don't know exactly what this is gonna smell like, but that's where the community members come in um, and it's worth keeping your noses um, out into the wind to, to assert uh, whether or not it smells. And also the Create Lab, which developed this Smell Pittsburgh app, could potentially extend that app to the area around Shell. They need to work with the local enforcement, um, like the DEP, to determine what kinds of reports might need to be submitted. But that is definitely a possibility if there is um, uh, on the ground interest in that. So the, another answer to will it smell is, well, it already has. And this is the um, data that we got in from several of the monitors around Shell, these low cost monitors. Um, during that sort of um, the antifreeze smell or waffle maple syrup smelling event that happened at Shell. And so it's worth noting that on September 27th, the PADEP issued a notice of violation for the odor and fugitive dust from Shell. Um, so does it, will it smell? Well, it already has, and there's already been a, no, a notice of violation issued for it. And one of the reasons why it's interesting to have both particle and VOC monitors at the same location is that sometimes when the wind blows through, but if there is a strong emission event happening, you may get a phenomenon where the particles drop like we're seeing here, I think, but um, the VOCs are actually going up. And so having two types of monitors, while it's difficult to sort of prove with any kind of legal um, enforcement ability, you can certainly use these monitors to ask very interesting nuanced questions about 
what is the pollution that is coming from the plant or coming from other, area, other, other emission sources in the region. Almost done here with my presentation. So what's next? So we're gonna see um, once the shell plant starts up and we have some time under our belt, um, EHP, Environmental Health Project, is going to release a uh, startup report that shows pre and post startup, what the monitors are showing. We're probably gonna be looking at more monitoring, deploying mo more monitors to get to at least about 20 sites and then possibly adding more, um, uh, especially BC Mac um, has received a grant and they're working on a community watchdog monitoring team that I'll be showing a slide for in just a moment that may involve additional monitoring and additional efforts to keep a close eye on Shell. There may also be initiatives to, um, to set up SUMA canisters or bucket brigade style buckets that collect, each of those things collect air samples that can be sent to a lab for a very detailed report of what kinds of pollution we're getting. We could use these in conjunction with the air, with the low cost monitors to know, hey, maybe there's an event happening now. Maybe we can engage with a community member who's shown interest to capture an air sample and then get it sent off to the lab. And I believe that um, with the help of the Create Lab, we can get the cost of those, um, those lab reports covered. Um, we may also do, you know, expand the Smell Pittsburgh app. We may also, I know that Purple Air seems to be dabbling with ozone monitors, and that could be a very interesting um, addition to the monitoring network. This is a quick uh, plug for the Eyes on Shell watchdog team that is being initiated by the BC Mac. And if you'd like to uh, learn more or host a monitor, contact info at marcellusawareness.org. And if you smell something, definitely say something. Check out the bit.ly link, Eyes on Shell. That's gonna take you to the BC, uh, BC Mac website with all sorts of resources about what to report, how to report it. Uh, but certainly if you feel that you're experiencing an emergency or a health emergency, do not hesitate to call 911. I can't give you health guidance, but I can say, um, you know, don't, don't get mired in the details. Um, if you feel you're experiencing a, a health emergency, just call 911. And that is all that I have for my presentation today. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna drop in all the links um, in the chat so that you can, you can check those out on your own time. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Mr. Dixon and Ms. Hoffman. Um, next up we have Ms. Terry Baumgartner, a Beaver County resident, member of BC Mac and the Beaver County Clean Air Outreach Coordinator at Clean Air Council. Ms. Baumgartner will discuss water, noise, light, and other pollution from the plant. Um, I'd also like to remind you to please put your questions in the chat box and we will try our best to get to them toward the end of this meeting. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Uh, and thank you for those of you who are joining us tonight. This cracker is of course going to bring us some noise, light, and water pollution. And we'll start with the invisible stressor of noise pollution. During normal operations, Shell must keep its noise level below 65 decibels. That's the equivalent of a heavy traffic at 300 feet. And if you look at the uh, chart on the right, you can see common daily decibel levels. The safe limit for noise pollution is 85 decibels. And that's uh, equivalent to the sound of a vacuum cleaner running eight hours a day. Noise pollution has ramifications for our health hearing loss and tinnitus, that ringing in the ears that afflicts it suffers are two of the obvious ones, but there's also stress related uh, illnesses that stem from constant or exposure to constant or high noise levels. The chart on the right uh, shows you how many ways in which stress affects our bodies and what happens with the constant and high noise levels is that our circadian clocks get disrupted. Those are the internal mechanisms that sync our sleep patterns with nature. Some of those related uh, stress-related illnesses are high blood pressure and heart disease. So what can you do? You could download a decibel phone app. Uh, there is one that is certified by the National Institutes for Occupational Safety and Health and report any louder continuing noise to the DEP or to Potter Township. You can host a baseline noise monitor, noise monitor at your home right now. And what happens is you have it there for only six days. This is a program through Westmoreland County's Protect PT organization. They loan out the um, noise monitors and it's just really very small, the size of a cell phone, small enough to fit inside that birdhouse. You can register for this at 
the address on the screen, or you can contact BC Max community organizer, Jake Wiedemer. And there's a picture of Jake at our address. Moving to light pollution, that artificial light in the night sky is a, perhaps the fastest growing form of environmental pollution. Big industrial facility lights like those of Shell are visible for tens of miles and they threaten residential quality of life and public health. Ramifications of light pollution might be surprising. LED lights especially disrupt the circadian clock and since this clock controls 10 to 15% of our genes, that disruption can alter brainwave patterns impairing our daytime functioning. That it can also alter hormone production and cell regulation and obesity levels. Medical disorders include depression and insomnia, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and increased breast cancer in some women. So what can you do? Again, report light pollution to the DEP and Potter Township. Their contact information is over to the right there and on the EOS page. Keep a log if you're low tech, take photos and videos if otherwise, and see darksky.org for some phone apps. As for water, it is the only one of these three that's federally regulated by the 1972 Clean Water Act, which sets industrial wastewater standards. And that's done through those NIPDES permits that you heard Shell, um, excuse me, you heard um, Cliff speak of when he was talking about Shell. Shell must submit to the DEP regular publicly available discharge monitoring reports called DMRs. And the DEP and EPA must conduct quality assurance inspections to validate this self-reported data. Why should we be concerned about water pollution? Well, 70 plus substances permitted in the plant's water dis discharges include three hazardous carcinogens of particular concern, benzene linked to leukemia, something called benzene, excuse me, benzopyrene, which can impact learning, movement abilities, and reproductive organs, and vinyl chloride associated with liver cancer. Water pollution is also linked to gastrointestinal illnesses, nervous system impacts, and reproductive impacts. So what can you do? Ask the DEP for those discharge monitoring reports, and if you see something curious, consult with an environmental organization engineer. For health and safety threats you spot, call the DEP or use its report and incident page. For violations, which are different from incidents, send DEP a written complaint, request your complete number, your complaint number, excuse me, and record it, or file uh, by, the, by way of the DEP's online form and follow up with a call or letter. You can also call the EPA or the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commissions. Get certified to do water sampling uh, on your own through an accredited lab or join the NERDL patrol. As uh, we've already learned, this plant is going to produce, um, Cliff, Cliff, I believe, said 1.8 million tons. If you put that in metric tons, it's 1.6 million metric tons of these building blocks of plastics, including the plastic bags. Those little plastic pellets uh, will constitute, produced by this plant, will constitute 20% of the 8 million metric tons per year of plastic that ends up in our oceans. A spill, a spill <clears throat> into the water or from a truck bed or rail car will find its way into our waterways and oceans and move up the food chain through fish into our bodies. Equally concerning along the way, uh, these little pellets attract toxins like PCBs and PAHs, those forever chemicals that are so deadly. Water pollution is being monitored by the NERDL Patrol. It has done work in the fall of last year and this year to find um, a baseline reading of NERDLs on the Ohio River. And you see um, those folks at work on the right if you want to join their efforts to monitor and report nurdles on shore or in water once Shell comes online, contact Mountain Watershed Association. There's their logo. And the point person is James Cato. There's his address. And that's all I have. I thank you for listening.
and um, hope you'll be vigilant with your reporting. Thank you so much for that presentation. Now we'll turn to our emergency response system in Beaver County and a special thanks to Mr. Eric Brewer, Beaver County Emergency Management, who's joining this call to let us know what changes have been made to our emergency systems and what will keep our community safe. Mr. Brewer. Hi, thanks. Um, I don't have any pretty slides. I just want to basically give you an overview of our, our organization and then how we work with the locals um, on response. So in Beaver County, we um, just make sure we're on. Okay. So in Beaver County, um, our, our department has two different divisions, 911 division and the emergency management division. Um, and 911 is just that it oversees our 911 operations. We have about 40 employees um, taking calls, dispatching calls to the appropriate agencies. Um, we dispatch for the whole county of Beaver, police, fire, and EMS. Uh, obviously 24 hour operations. Um, the emergency management division or the EMA, um, we have three different functions. Uh, EMAs, so remember Pennsylvania is a commonwealth, so the lowest form is basically responsible. Um, and each municipality under Title 35, which is kind of like the emergency management Bible, Bible um, each municipality is required to have an emergency management coordinator for that municipality. In our county, some of them share. So we have 54 municipalities. Um, some of the municipalities share a coordinator. Uh, another part of the EMA division is the REP program, the Radiological Emergency Preparedness. And because we have a nuclear power plant in the county, um, we do preparedness with the local municipalities, local responders, um, training for bus drivers, schools, um, <clears throat> police departments, fire departments, and such. Um, and then the hazardous, ha excuse me, hazardous materials response program. Um, we have a hazmat team in, in the county. It's a county hazmat team that assists the locals, the local fire departments, police departments, or uh, whoever's out on the scene there. Again, we are um, we're an assistance to the local uh, responders because everything starts local. Um, kind of the way we're 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 funded is each each hazmat uh, or each um, company pays the county and the state a small fee uh, depending on what they have on site and that falls under SARA uh, or the EPRA emergency uh, preparedness community right to know which is a uh, used to be SARA the Superfunds uh, Amendment and Reauthorization Act that came in back in 84 because of the Bhopal incident um, that's a whole nother program, I guess, if you will. Anyway, we're, we're funded by the um, companies themselves who have used, produce, or store hazmat on their properties. Um, the hazmat team is 20 to about 25 individuals who are trained in hazardous materials, not just fire. Uh, we have some chemists, we have some um, firefighters, we have industrial uh, firefighters on the team, and we go out on specialty responses. Uh, some things that we're not, we don't do air monitoring for the county. Uh, we rely on the DEP to do that. We do not do water monitoring. We rely on the DEP to do that. And we work with DEP and EPA um, on responses also. And it's important to note that also Beaver County does not have a Department of Health under the local government. We use the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, their office is in Bridgewater. Um, they basically have a, a community health nurse in there. Now, I'm not gonna speak for them, but yes, just important to know that the county government does not have a Department of Health. Um, so again, uh, if there was, if there were an incident and, um, and we have 60 or 70 so reporting facilities in the county, chemical reporting facilities. Um, the local municipality or the lo local responders would be there first 
they would request assistance from if if needed from the county's hazmat team and depending on what it is um again we could ask for other assistance from state agencies or epa or or other counties so that's kind of where we would fit in if there was a response to the facility thanks thank you and our final presentation comes to us from Houston, Texas. A special thanks to Mixup Ivet Ariano, the founder of Fenceline Watch, for joining our event to discuss Texas's experience and what we can expect living there at petrochemical facility here. Mix Ariano. Hi, good evening. Um, I apologize for not I apologize for not being able to uh, share a presentation with you all right now. I'm gonna turn off my camera real quick. Um, because this year is the year that we've had the most flaring out of every other year. Uh, this is news we got from our county. This is flaring that we're currently experiencing right now. And every intention pulls that it's only gonna get worse. <laughs> and the reason why is because of extreme weather events, which is one topic I actually didn't anticipate to cover on this call, uh, but seems like a timely thing to do. And the reason why is because uh, Texas is looking to once again freeze uh, this upcoming February. So my heed and my warning uh, that I would express to folks currently on the call is that any infrastructure uh, leading up, uh, currently undergoing, uh, currently going underway right now is to weatherize. This is something that industry, whether it's oil, gas, or petrochemicals is currently pushing against. And unfortunately for us here in the home of the largest petrochemical complex, uh, we are not, we don't have weatherization systems in place. And Texas has a very unique system of governance when it comes to oil and gas facilities where Regulatory, uh, re regulatory agencies that regulate utilities, including uh, our power grid, also regulate certain oil and gas infrastructure. So it takes uh, the interagency work of the utility uh, regulating agencies, FERC, and our Texas State Environmental Agency, known as the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, in order to set uh, all of those weatherization pieces in place, which we're currently trying to get infrastructure money to help us uh, push for these regulatory devices. So if you, the infrastructure going in to your neighborhoods, to your surrounding area is currently going in place as much as we want to push back against specific facilities, pushing for weatherization is one way to uh, help pause a facility and make it reconsider the infrastructure that's going into place because what we experience is that during extreme weather events uh, where flaring is excessive uh, there is a certain provision in the refinery rule standard and the chemical security act that allows for uh, nature act of god or act of nature events where refineries petrochemical plants uh, fossil fuel industries can emit excessive fugitive emissions that go uncontrolled and underreported and do not go through and don't go through a reporting system where we can then verify how many emissions were actually released. And so uh, those emissions, they aren't in a position for us to fight or challenge or even uh, look for any fines uh, because of this act of God or act of nature defense. So with infrastructure that's currently going in, I know that agencies, petrochemical uh, and industry say that this infrastructure is going in for anywhere from 40 to 60 years. But the truth of it is that that infrastructure will be there for as long as humanly possible. And in our case, we have facilities like Lion del Basel Baytown's Exxon Mobil, 
currently our shell uh, techno our shell deer park plant is causing the most excessive flaring with flares over 16 over 20 feet high uh, and we're searching for any answers as to why that flaring is going underway every single time we call to try and report all of these excessive flaring events were met with flaring is something that's supposed to keep these systems safe. And there is no other information over whether or not it's weather related. So my big push for this call is to try and get residents to approach any infrastructure projects that look like they're going to succeed and advance is to push for weatherization. The only other thing I could possibly add to this call is the fact that Fence Line Watch has now over a year's worth of dedication specifically towards language justice. Uh, and our language justice fight has succeeded in helping pause and halt current infrastructure projects. And the reason why is because Title VI provisions, which is the Civil Rights Act, forces fossil fuel industries to make sure that they have information accessible to vulnerable and marginalized populations. This includes populations that speak other languages, whether it is English, whether it's uh, Vietnamese, Mandarin. So something I urge people and organizers on this call to do is understand what the community's current makeup looks like. And there is a variety of tools that can help you identify where, where those communities lie, including the EJ screen. Just today, EPA had a series of, uh, had a series of question and answer sessions through their EJ screen uh, open hours and so what they were trying to do is trying to make sure that people understood how to use EJ screen. Where you currently are, EPA, your EPA region, you have a right to ask your EPA region to hold an EJ screen training. The EJ screen training will train you to identify certain communities that speak other languages that are marginalized because of income, because of education, and they allow you to draw on your current city or state maps and identify where those communities are. So the point here is to go and make sure you do that outreach because this civil rights provision on language and access is extremely powerful and it's important to try and allow as much inclusivity and the permit challenges that you're about to face. This doesn't just cover languages, it also covers disability and access. So push for any current public meetings around these infrastructure projects to have maximum accessibility towards those who are disabled, older generations, and also language provisions for folks who speak non-English dominant languages and also uh, the hearing impaired. That was invaluable information that I wish we had more guided uh, direction towards. And fortunately, we were able to um, canvas and go door knocking and we understood what our community's makeup was. But both language access and the increased extreme weather that we're all facing right now are two anchor pieces that I stress for everyone's advocacy work because they are successful pieces because states like Texas, although they're red and oil, gas and fossil fuel captured are taking a pause and a minute to assess whether or not the infrastructure going into, we're talking about multi-million, multi-billion dollar pieces of infrastructure. Community members do not wanna see themselves in a situation where they're rushing out to flaring events like we do here in Houston because of extreme weather and oil and gas and the fossil fuel industry is not trying to put their invaluable infrastructure in harm's way. The only other case that I could point towards is Louisiana, where the state implemented a state implementation plan led by the fossil fuel industry, because as Louisiana lost shoreline, the waters became or 
imports and exports started becoming vulnerable to open waters, meaning harsher conditions uh, from waves, from tides, and especially during hurricane seasons. So it was that combination of understanding that our climate isn't going to to get any better, understanding what kind of extreme weather conditions you're facing and putting those systems in place, whether it's the re- weatherization of a fossil fuel industry or it's a toxic alert system so that you make sure that your community is alerted as soon as a fugitive emission, as soon as an extreme chemical event goes into place. We have been so fortunate to be able to help our partners in West Virginia during the West Virginia chemical disaster. And I wish we had had conversations like this sooner to help guide our partners and let them know, one, become familiar with the EJ screen. Two, when you do, it's important for you to understand Uh, the significance of the toxic release inventory, which is an inventory that tells you all the chemicals that are being released that are self-reported from each industry and their health impacts. And three, it gives you the physical location of a facility for and if when a chemical disaster happens, because these are the kind of releases that cause neurological, developmental, uh, slower speech patterns and reproductive health issues in our communities. So that information has been invaluable to try and let EPA know we know what we're talking about. If and when chemical disaster strikes, there are three agencies that you should become familiar with at this point, before any infrastructure goes into place, the first one is your EPA region and assuring that your EPA region has either an EJ or a community outreach point of contact that you could get a hold of if and when a chemical disaster happens. The second one is going to be someone within your state agency, which once you get familiar with the EPA uh, region staff, They are going to be your point person. They are going to be the person or they are going to be the agency that leads something called a unified command force. The unified command force is made up of local municipalities, state agencies, and your EPA region. When that chemical disaster or if a flaring event, an extreme event hits, Your EPA region is who you will reach out to and you will ask the following questions. You will ask, what is going on? Who is responding to this current event? Three, how long is this event estimated to last? Four, what are the health impacts? And then you want to end that email by saying, we want a daily report, which for us during our chemical disaster events, the more extreme they got, we were able to receive a morning report, a midday report, and an evening report. And as the situation progressed and got better, then it, they, then it got down to one daily report. It's important for you to get your hands on that daily report because this is what you're going to use to make sure you hold those industries accountable and so that you can take it to your local municipalities and ask the questions around cleanup. So the last piece for that email should read, I want to know What is the cleanup strategy and where will the hazardous waste be placed? How will it be transported? Will it be tracked? And where will it be placed are important because as hazardous waste is removed from a chemical disaster site, it could be going through your neighborhood. It could be held off in open waters. It could be held at a local landfill. These are the situations you wanna avoid. Tracking your transportation is important because you want to know if that hazardous waste is going through your community. And third, where will it end up? You do not want this hazardous waste. And I'm sure everyone listening understands you don't want it near your schools, near senior centers and your communities themselves. So I hope that this information has been invaluable and we are looking forward to providing this uh, in a toolkit that we're releasing as part of our initiative over crisis response. Thank you. Thank you, Nixariano. 
And thank you to all of our speakers for your very informative presentations tonight. Um, I recognize that we're coming on 8.30 and initially this was planned to go until 8.30. Um, many of the presenters are willing to stay on a little longer to answer questions. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone's got the link to the Eyes on Shell Emergency Resources to Protect Our Community. You can see it's posted. Um, the bit.ly link is bit.ly slash eyes on shell. That's all one word. Um, our first question is for Dr. Kataire. Um, what should I tell my doctor if my child is having concerning symptoms and what might symptoms look like? Um, well, uh, I think the most important thing to tell your doctor uh, as the pediatrician um, make sure your pediatrician knows who your child lives with uh, and where your child lives. Uh, where do they go to school? Where do they uh, spend their free time uh, playing sports or outdoor activities? Kids spend more time outdoors. Uh, make sure that uh, your doctor has your child's full medical history uh, and that that history is in the medical chart uh, so that all health providers can uh, get information to help your child. Uh, write down the symptoms that your child is having um, uh, when those symptoms started, uh, things they do uh, that make the symptoms better or things that happen uh, like uh, changes in the weather where the symptoms get worse. Um, uh, that's, that's important. Um, also, you know, find out if your kid's friends are sick. I think that's also uh, pretty handy information for your pediatrician. It's important though, that if your uh, pediatrician or your, your family physician uh, doesn't know what a cracker plant is uh, or how pollution from a cracker plant or a petrochemical facility um, can harm health, um, uh, you know, make sure that, um, uh, that, that you give them the link, uh, the eyes on shell link so they can get that handy information uh, and encourage them to call me at PSR Pennsylvania uh, or uh, call my colleagues at the Environmental Health Project. Thank you. Um, I've got, looks like there are two questions for Mr. Brewer. Um, these two are related, and then there's another question after that. Um, is Shell still required to give the community 30 days notice that the plant will be starting up as stated in the Potter Township Ordinance? How will residents be notified? And then there's another question, um, you know, I'll, let, I'll have you answer that one first, then I'll get to the other question. Yeah, I, I don't know. You don't, I, again, that's a local, um, local question. I can't speak on behalf of Potter Township. The, as far as the county, though, um, the county would, does not require that. Thank you. Um, and then another question is... Um, when I called the fire department near Miranda Homes to ask them what the emergency plan was in the event of a Felton Pipeline mishap, the woman I talked to had no idea what I was talking about. It was not clear if she even knew about the pipeline's existence, let alone had the ability to advise me in any way. It's my understanding that the Falcon Pipeline cuts through the residential tract at Miranda Farms. Um, she's asking why has Shell not released their safety plan yet? And I think a, another question is when is Shell going to release the safety plan if the residents need to evacuate? As far as the, uh, the pipeline, I mean, that's, that's a different part division of Shell. <laughs> um, we work, we go through this kind of all the time with, um, so there's a, the cracker plant and then there's the pipeline um as far as locally i mean the county we did um we did an exercise with the um with shell out in raccoon probably um it was in 2020 so it was an emergency response exercise with uh, with them so maybe uh, i don't know who he called at the local fire department i'm not sure um but it there were local fire departments there, local uh, you know, EMS and police did, did, did do an exercise. Um, and they're required to pipelines, again, getting on a different subject, but pipelines are, are required to report to. We do, we do work with them. Um, right, there was another question. Was there another one? No, that was it, that was it. Um, okay. The next question is from Mr. Kerner.
Let's see. You're muted here. Sorry about that. Um, according to federal pipeline safety regulations, Shell Pipeline must implement a written continuing public education program about the Falcon Pipeline for the public, government organizations, and persons engaged in excavation activities. This program must include messaging on the possible hazards associated with leaks, physical indications that such a release may have occurred, and steps that should be taken for public safety in the event of a leak, and procedures to report such an event. Um, I, Mr. Kerner, would, will Shell be able to offer such a program? I think you'd probably be the best to answer that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know for sure. I worked a little bit on the Falcon pipeline. I know that there are some like PEMSA regulations that may apply or may have something like is described there. Uh, but yeah, I'm not super familiar with what the FERC requirements are or what the PEMSA requirements are. Uh, I mean, I think that part of that is going to be emergency response uh, for pipeline failure. And that might be... <laughs> Uh, the better question. I, I don't know, honestly, though. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from Exadiano. What does the air smell like while the flaring is going on? So one, we just responded to a flaring event and the, the I mean, it really depends. It can smell anything from an extremely sweet. I'm talking about um, if people are familiar with baking and uh, making icing, then it can smell extremely sweet, but uh, the kind of sweetness that gives you a headache. So that would be more along the lines of benzene. It could smell like basketball tires. Give me one second. Recording, recording in progress. progress. It can, it can smell, smell like, like oh. Looks like Yvette is getting her another device going. Yes, sorry. Uh, it can smell like gasoline. I can tell you that this last flaring event that we just responded to, uh, the flares were so large that it looked like a sunset. You could see the flares just gleam right off of your face and your skin felt extremely hot. Uh, something that we reported was that our skin felt like it was burning. And when you get burning sensations coming across these flaring events, the first place that is gonna make that feeling uh, is going to get that feeling is going to be your cheeks, your nose, and your forehead, any piece that's exposed, really. So when you go and respond to these flaring events and trying to go and document them, you want to make sure that you have as much coverage as possible. So you're going to feel the effects before you even smell them. We're talking about headaches, uh, something that feels like uh, congested sinuses, uh, you will feel burning on your skin uh, and you can, yeah, those are the things. And depending on what it is, it could be nausea. So it really depends on the kind of chemicals, whether it's an uh, above ground storage tank, if it's a flaring event coming from a processing unit. Um, yeah. So those are the, the two pieces that, that I would share just because we just responded to one. Thank you. Um, Can I add you, one more thing? Oh, yeah, and then I've got another question for you. Okay. What I would add is uh, with first responders, I would urge uh, residents to push for an interagency work group. Something we realized was that our fire department wasn't meeting with any oil and gas agencies to try and come up with uh, chemical emergency response plans. And so when we finally developed an interagency work group, our first responders, our local firefighters said, we would love to have this information. If we could get updates like this once quarterly, because we have such a massive petrochemical complex, but even if it was just once a year, making sure that your LEPCs, 
your residents, your community groups, and your first responders are seeing everything that's going on uh, is extremely important. So an interagency work group. Thank you. Um, and then um, you had mentioned weatherization. Um, would you be willing to explain what that is or, or like weatherization of what specifically? Oops, you're, you're muted. I, I did the same thing. With above ground storage tanks, uh, we're talking about response systems. So uh, mainly foaming devices that can put out fires that happen in above ground storage tanks, making sure that uh, they're up to date, making sure that there's inspections around them. Uh, one event that we faced about two years ago with a four-day chemical disaster known as the uh, international, the ITC event or international um, uh, terminal was that first responders didn't have enough flame retardant foam on site. They had to ship it in from states like Louisiana and Oklahoma. So assuring that if you do have a fire, you have enough flame retardant, seems like it makes sense, but you know, industry doesn't have the kind of provisions or regulations that push for those kind of safety mechanisms. Thank you. Um, and you, you bring in uh, flame retardant and firefighting foams, and there's a question in the chat about, um, will PFAS containing firefighting foams be used to extinguish fire should they occur? And, Maybe that's a question for Mr. Brewer. Um, so, again, we're going to go off the local, uh, and Shell has a um, has a emergency response team already, and they're going through training already. And truthfully, they're they're probably better equipped. Than, than the local. I mean, with their equipment, it's state of the art, the newest out there. Um, so I'm not sure if they're going to have enough on site, but I know that firefighting foam will be used. Um, we do have some, and we also have a, a good working relationship with the Pittsburgh International Airport, who has um, foam capabilities. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Lau. Um, you'd mentioned that the shell plant wasn't just an ethane cracking plant, but also a polymer, polymerization plant. Uh, what does a polymerization plant do or produce? Well, polymerize, it's taking the ethane, cracking it into the, or dehydrogenating it to make ethylene. And then they, that's a small two carbon unit and then the unit that I showed with the big tower and stuff, they run it up and down there with a slurry uh, uh, polymerization process to build the molecular weight out to be thousands of units. And that's what you see um, in your plastic bags and your, it's called linear low density polyethylene or the high density polyethylene, like making containers and things. So it's taking a small little unit and as it says, poly, many, MERS, one. So making plastic out of many little parts. Thank you. Um, I don't know who would be best to answer this question. So um, it's open. Um, I recall several news stories last year on the possibility that Shell and its contractors knowingly ignored and or covered up defects in the pipeline, such as inadequate or incorrect liner, lining and sealers to prevent leaks and other dangers. Can someone address where investigation of those has gone? Going once, going twice. I'm going to move on to the next question. 
Sister Carrie, I would just refer the questioner to fracktracker.org, which Thank has you. spearheaded that investigation. And they did um, try to get answers from BIMSA, but they weren't particularly satisfactory answers. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. I appreciate you jumping in to say that. Um, Can I add something about the the fire, um, the flame retardant question, which was, will a retardant have PFAS or not with us? Because there wasn't enough um, flame retardant on site. They used a mixture, meaning the mixture did have PFAS. And because the flame retardant is a foam, is like any you know soap foam, uh, the foam started being picked up by the wind. And when it got picked up by the wind, you had foam landing in playgrounds at elementary schools and people's yards uh, because it's extremely light. And so something people didn't know is don't touch the foam. In fact, take pictures of the foam to make sure that you document that it's landing on your property because that'll let you know how far the actual impacts from a chemical disaster are. And it was the firefighting foam that made its way into our local ship channel and uh, continued to contaminate uh, waterways that are used for fishing, that are used for commerce. And so there wasn't a response team that could go fast enough and capture as much of the uh, flame retardant or the contaminated water. So that's what I was talking about when uh, we were when I was stating, understand where the hazardous waste is going, how it's being tracked, because the water that was being tracked and was being contained, was being held right off of the ship channel in communities. So anything that could make it into the air was continuing to fume even after exposure or after the initial exposure. Thank you for that. Um, I've got another question for Mr. Perner. How long could the permitting process delay startup of this plant and is there potentially any opportunity to stop it? A fine quality permit must be approved by the DEP within 180 days of startup, right? Can we demand a public hearing? So as far as I know, there will be a public hearing for the Title V permit. I think there has to be by law. Um, in terms of how long they can be delayed, um, I mean, I've seen plants just uh, since it's already being built, uh, generally once it's permitted and it's been built, uh, there's not much you can do. Like I've seen plants pour concrete pads to say, oh, we're keeping our permit good. Um, yeah, in terms of like Title V permits ever being denied, I don't have any experience with that happening. Um, that isn't to say that they aren't denied. It's just there has to be a basis for which the department can deny them. And usually the department's pretty conservative when it comes to that. Uh, it has to be like a strong technical basis that they're willing to go to court over. And I think the likelihood of that happening is extremely low, especially now um, since the plan approval was already approved. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got another question for Dr. Katire. Um is there going to be any kind of health monitoring for residents in the areas that are affected, meaning volunteers who would get tested for certain things such as respiratory function prior to operations and then on a regular basis afterwards, one to three years later? Um, I feel like this would give us a better idea on how this is actually harming residents directly in these areas. Um, are you aware of any plans for that, Dr. Katire? Uh, I agree that it would be a good idea uh, in a situation that's full of really bad ideas, like building a cracker plant in a populated area. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, studies that are uh, underway, prospective studies, uh, looking at the health of individuals in these communities. Um, you know, we, there is experience of, of doing studies. Uh, there were studies done in the Mon Valley that actually showed that the risk uh, of uh, asthma in children is two to three times higher in children around the pollution in the Mon Valley uh, than the rest of the state or the country. So uh, there are people 
uh, that can do that kind of uh, uh, research. Uh, I, uh, you know, I think of the Department of Health is is uh, is already doing research, looking on the disaster of fracking and the potential uh, that fracking has uh, caused the spike in uh, rare childhood cancers. Uh, so they're pretty busy doing that. Um, you know, I think uh, it would be a good idea. Uh, it's really an all hands on deck moment right now in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and it would be nice to have a little bit of curiosity from the public health officials to study this. Thank you. Um, this next question, I think, is for Mr. Krohn. Has the DEP been out to measure baseline air and water quality for the construction site and noise and air pollution? Uh, that, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I know that, you know, there was like, uh, for the permitting, there was um, like uh, an inhalation risk assessment that um, that was required as part of the permitting process. And perhaps Carl could speak more to that. But um, I don't know if uh, DEP has been out there since uh, Shell began construction or like, you know, in time since uh, that uh, uh, inhalation risk assessment was completed. Yeah, there there was an updated inhalation risk assessment. It's just, uh, I actually posted it earlier. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if DP has been out there with monitors or anything like that. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm aware that we've gone 20 minutes over. Um, and so I'd just really like to thank our presenters um, for the work that you put into making tonight happen, um, for staying extra to answer uh, some of the questions. A uh, special thanks to the host, Beaver County Marcellus Awareness Community, BC Mac, and the event sponsors, the Breathe Project and the League of Women Voters of uh, Pennsylvania. Visit their websites, drop them an email, follow them on social media, and have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>